blood. This is blood. So listen to this. The four basic tissue types, right? Epithelial, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Where does blood fall? Anybody know? Connective tissue, yeah. It is. It is. It's CT. Connective tissue. Because my definition of connective tissue, not just mine, is sparse cells with a matrix. That's the definition of connective tissue. And, and not to mention that all connective tissue is derived from the same embryological tissue, which is called mesenchyme. I don't know if you remember that from AMP1. So it's the stem cells are basically the same before they decide what they're going to be. Now, these cells you're learning today are dedicated, committed blood stem cells. So there's different levels of stem cells. First, there's a totipotent, which is, that could become placenta, that could become any tissue in the body. Then it becomes pluripotent, and that's everything but the placenta. And then it becomes multipotent, which becomes the tissue it's going to be, like mesenchyme. Or, um, you have nervous tissue, which is ectoderm and endoderm and mesoderm. You don't have to know that, but... But you should know that blood is connective tissue because it has sparse cells with the matrix. So what are the sparse cells? Let's, let's say the big boy word for this. Let's, what if I say erythrocyte? It's one word. What would that be? Red blood cell or white blood cell? Erythro means what? Red blood cell. Red blood cell. So that means red. Then you have, and these are really specialized, important. Then you have leuco, okay, leukocyte, sometimes C, and that would be what? White blood cell or platelet? White, White blood cell. cell. White blood cell. And then you have your thrombocyte. And that would be your platelet. Thrombo means clot, leuco means white. So erythrocyte, I, let me tell you one thing. First of all, the big, the big thing you're going to see here, it's a nuclear. Whenever you see an A in front of something or an AN, it means it doesn't have it. It ha doesn't have a nucleus. In the mature erythrocyte, red blood cell, it doesn't have a nucleus. So the job of the erythrocyte is basically to carry oxygen. And anybody know the protein that's inside an erythrocyte that carries the oxygen on its heme. Hemoglobin? You got it, hemoglobin, hemoglobin. Let me tell you something, there's 250 million molecules of hemoglobin in one red blood cell. And each hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecules of oxygen, O2, right, O2. Excellent, so that's really important. So most of the oxygen in your body, in your blood, I should say, is being carried on hemoglobin in the red blood cell, which has no nucleus. All cells have a membrane. Then you have these leukocytes, and you're gonna learn five of these. Some have granules, which we call fills. Some have these big nucleus, nuclei, which we call sites like lymphocyte, B and T lymphocyte, and monocyte. So we'll take a look at those. Those are probably the hardest which for you to remember. That's what the lab will be about, looking under a microscope and seeing what the cells look like, like histology. And a thrombocyte, guess what? A mature thrombocyte doesn't have a nucleus either. So the leukocytes have weird looking nuclei. Some are really big, some are small with granules. And they have different functions. And I'll, I'll go through that with you before you go into the lab. Platelets are like fragmented cells. And they're for keeping the blood in, in, the, in the vessels. And that's called hemostasis. And clotting is called coagulation. Let's write that in those words. Hemostasis. I like that word. It's not homeostasis. It's hemostasis. Keeps the blood in the vessel. 
So it forms like a net, these platelets. They're very sticky. They have a lot of chemicals that they release to bring in other clotting factors. And then they cause clotting, which is called coagulation. You're going to hear a word later. I'm not going to write it down now because I don't want to confuse you. But it's called agglutination. Now, agglutination is an antibody reaction, like a T cell reaction or B cell reaction against an antigen. And we'll talk about that when we do blood typing. But for now, just remember platelets, thrombocytes are part of the coagulation cascades for clotting. So again, I took this from your textbook, not your lab manual. So there's a lot of information on in this PowerPoint, but it's not too bad, actually. It's, it's pretty good for you to get a little background reading before you move into more cardiovascular and lecture and lab. Okay, so the cardiovascular system basically pumps blood around. You know that pumpy thing in the middle of your chest called the heart? That's all cardiac muscle. It's, it's very specialized because it has its own electrical system. So the heart has what's called automaticity. Just a little background. Like if I ripped your heart out, right? And I put it in, and I'm, and we're at Buffalo Wild Wings, right? And I take your heart out and I put it in an isotonic solution. It's gonna keep beating. As long as I keep those ions flowing into that pacemaker of the heart, you're gonna learn about the SA node and all that. So that's pretty cool. And it's cardiac muscles, of course, it's not skeletal muscle. So that's the pumpy thing that pumps the blood away from the heart, of course, so this is the definition of an artery. An artery takes blood away from the heart. A vein drains, takes blood back to the heart. But in the capillaries, that's where the magic happens. That's, there's only one layer of cells in the capillary. Like arteries are really muscular and elastic. Veins are thin and have valves to, to prevent backflow. Capillaries are thin walled, one layer of simple squamous epithelium and a basement membrane that allows for exchange. Like what? Oxygen and carbon dioxide, water, and all the other fun stuff like calcium and sodium, chloride at times, phosphate, all these fun stuff. Not to mention glucose, amino acids and fatty acids, so that's cool. So here you go, here's the big boy words, erythrocyte, red blood cell. And this is what it does, it transport gases. But seven, I would say 98% of oxygen in your blood is carried on hemoglobin in the red blood cell. But only 23%, 23%, yeah, I think that's right, 20% of CO2 is carried on hemoglobin. It's kind of, it's not the same place. They don't bind to the same thing. Like oxygen binds to the heme of the hemoglobin where carbon dioxide binds to the protein, the globin part, alpha and beta chains of the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is carried another way, not so much in the erythrocytes, it's carried on the bicarbonate ion, which we'll talk about in blood lecture. Leukocytes, white blood cells, I think there's five types or five examples we're gonna do. And that's for defense, right? These are the Marines. Actually, yeah, these are probably the Marines. You think about the white blood cells that are in the blood and tissue together. Platelets, where's my word? Thrombocyte, remember throm, thrombo means clot. Site means cell. And here's the matrix. I forgot to mention the matrix before. I only told you the sparse cells, but the matrix is plasma. It's kind of straw colored, watery. It's high, high water content. I'll see what your lab says. I, I would say it's gotta be 80% 80, 80 water, maybe more. 80% of plasma is water, that's what I'm saying. So water is the universal solvent and every fluid in your body, we're watery. We're definitely watery. Okay, and then there's proteins, proteins in the plasma. This is important because you need a good level of proteins. And the most important protein in the blood is called, it's called albumin. And it could be E or an N at the end, depends if you're cracking an egg or you're in the blood. So that's the protein that maintains, listen to this, 
maintains osmotic pressure. That's really important in your blood, the osmotic pressure. Osmosis is the diffusion of water, usually following a solute like sodium. So the plasma proteins have to stay in the blood. They can't leave. And dissolve, dissolve solutes are the other things. Like so actually, carbon dioxide is a dissolved solute. Sodium, potassium, chloride, urea, which is a breakdown product of your protein digestion. So it's transporting. So if, if the heart is like the pump, the blood vessels are the roadways, right? So our body's about this, let's face it. We wanna get oxygen in to our cells via the cardiovascular system, the arteries. And we wanna get carbon, di carbon dioxide the hell out. And that we have to get to the lungs to get out of our tissue and out of our body. And then we have nutrients, I mentioned those glucose, um, amino acids, fatty acids, and then your chemical messengers, like your hormones, right? You have testosterone, you have um, aldosterone, cortisol, insulin, glucagon. Oh, you're learning all that stuff, right? All these targets, ADH, angiotensinogen, angiotensin, angiotensin, renin, I can go on and on, right? And every once a month, estrogen and progesterone and all those other LH, my goodness, thyroid hormone goes on. It goes on. And of course, body temperature. You remember that from AMP1, how the blood temperature should be there at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And it should be third. And that trans, translates to 37 degrees Celsius. That's a quick inversion for you. By the way, since we're on the subject of the homeostasis of blood, what should the pH be of blood, the percent of hydrogen? Like zero is a very acidic. Should 14 it be like 7.35 or something? Let's just say 7.4 and live there, okay? There is a range, 7.35 to 7.45, but the pH of blood should be 7.4. So if it goes 7.39, technically that's acidic or acidosis. If it goes to 7.4, 7.5, it's technically alkaline or base. Alkaline and base mean the same thing. So let's live at these homeostatic ranges here. Thank you. Okay, so protection. The leukocytes and the thrombocytes protect. All right, platelets. Our body's really, really, really worried about blood loss. Because if we lose blood cells, we lose our oxygen carrying capacity and our brain can't function without oxygen. I don't know how long. Todd, what do you think? Six minutes, 10 minutes, and, and we become a carrot, right? So the heart, cardiac output, the blood vessels transferring blood tr and transporting blood and platelets helping the loss of blood all has to do with getting oxygen to the tissue, especially the brain. Whew. Body temperature, body pH. Fluid balance, now this has to do with osmotic pressure, right? Water is reabsorbed in the GI tract and also the kidney. That's not, what about the kidney? Water is added back to the blood and the kidney in a big way. Why do we have ADH and aldosterone, right? We probably lost a lot of ADH last night if you, if you drank Jameson or um, Tito's or something like that, because that shuts off your ADH and that makes you pee too much. But I never, I don't know what that means. I just read it in a book. Okay, so urine is urine and we sweat and we lose a smaller bit of water vapor when we exhale. So I'm not gonna go into this too deep, but you should know the fluid compartments. You know, you have the blood, right? Blood in, which is plasma, blood plasma. Then you have another space in here called the ECF, which is the extracellular fluid. Then you have the cells, right? The cells with cute little nucleus in there. And that's the intracellular fluid or cytosol. So there has to be a nice osmotic balance between the blood fluid, the interstitial space and the intracellular space, which is the cytosol, which is part of the cytoplasm of the cell. So if you get something like oxygen, it's got to diffuse into the ECF. 
then it's got to diffuse into the cytosol to get into the mitochondria and make that ATP, right? And hopefully in the presence of glucose. So the same things for glucose too, like glucose has to do that. Glucose can diffuse out, but it's got to be facilitatedly brought in. It's got, it needs a carrier to go in to a cell and then into the cytoplasm. So you should know those fluid compartments, how the osmotic pressure keeps things moving in and out of cells from the blood through the ECF. All right, it's color of blood. So when hemoglobin is bound with oxygen, remember oxygen binds to the heme on the hemoglobin, and this is in the red blood cell, it glows red, especially when it's 100% saturated. So I, listen to this, I told you that there are, how many, how many binding sites on hemoglobin are there for oxygen? Remember what I said? Four. There's four. four. So that if it's 100% saturated, like when it's going through the lungs, that means all four binding sites are uh, bound. Now, oxygen poor glows dark red, which is, real, let's just say blue, right? Because the veins look blue, not the veins, but the deoxygenated vessels look blue. Because sometimes you're going to learn in the pulmonary circuit, a pulmonary vein is red. You're going you're to learn that contradiction. I, I'm not teaching that now, but I just want you to know the definition of an artery and definition of a vein, which I told you already. Arteries take blood away from the heart. Veins bring blood back to the heart. So this is blue. So now the hemoglobin, it's not 0% oxygenated. They don't, like this one has four. Okay, so let me draw this out. This one has four at 100%. So this is 75%, which means... There's three oxygens on there. So it still has oxygen, always has oxygen, but it only has three. So deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood glows darker, bluish, and that's 75% oxygenated. Cool, we have about five liters of blood, five, about five pints of blood in the adult. And we really wanna get that blood, all of that five liters through the heart in a minute. That'd be really nice at rest, cardiac output based on 75 beats per minute. Cool. Viscosity is like the thickness of blood and that should be homeostatic. You don't want too many red blood cells, but you want homeostatic number of bloods, red blood cells, like 6 million or whatever your book's going to say. So it's thicker than water, obviously. Then if you put water in a beaker and you put blood in a beaker, it's going to be thicker and you'll see what blood looks like in a test tube or a beaker. Cool. So you get the concentration of whatever's in the blood and you could, you could do that through a blood test, which you're going to see in the lab. So <clears throat> blood temperatures is slightly higher in Celsius. So it's 37 degrees of your body temperature is a little bit lower. pH, now here's the, the range. I'm not comfortable with this range because this is a compensatory range. So please, I like blood to be at 7.4 pH. So this means if this goes in any direction away from 7.4, it means that the kidneys and lungs have to try to balance that pH and get it back to homeostasis. Cool. And it, because if it goes too acidic, blood cells are mostly protein, right? The hemoglobin. So at a hostile pHs, like a low, especially acidic, our body hates acidic pHs. It's going to destroy the shape. And the shape of a protein, if it's destroyed, is called denaturation. Like if it's the temperature is too hot or the pH is too low, it's going to cause a problem in shape. Okay. So this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna take a whole blood sample, which is the plasma and formed elements. That's remember, this is a, that's why I call it connective tissue. And they're gonna spin this down to separate because they really don't mix. You know, you, you do have fat in your blood too. Normally, you know, carriers, uh, not carriers, but cholesterol and lipids. And that's why they need carriers. Like cholesterol needs a carrier because cholesterol is a lipid right? It doesn't mix well in water. So something like cholesterol or triglycerides need carriers. And you might've heard of something like an LDL, a low density lipoprotein or HDL, which is a high density lipoprotein. And they're proteins that carry fats around. So they don't 
drown in the plasma, so to speak. They wouldn't mix. They wouldn't get moved around. They would cause a big problem if you didn't have those carriers. So LDLs are bad if you have too high, too many of those, because that's high cholesterol and triglyceride. HDLs are high protein, low lipids. So we like HDLs. We don't like LDLs going too high. Homeostatic is good. So red blood cells, 44% of your blood sample when you take it out. I thought it'd be higher. That's okay, because it's mostly plasma. So it's mostly water. Your blood is mostly water, 55%, 44% red blood cells. And that 1% is your platelets and white blood cells. So I think you should remember these when you're doing your labs today. So it's 55% water and only 1%. And Buffy coat, you'll see, I'll show you a picture of that. Buffy coat. So here's what you see. First of all, we're gonna go in there, right? And we're gonna take, we'll take venous blood. You could take venous blood, unless you, listen to this, unless you're doing an arterial blood gas where you're just looking for oxygen content and saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin, you have to do an artery, you have to poke an artery. But if you're doing just a, a blood count, like this is gonna be called a complete blood count, you don't have to poke an artery, you could poke a, a vein, which is operating under much less pressure. Because if you poke an artery and you make a mistake, it's gonna be like a horror movie with blood spurting all over the place because arteries have very thick walls and operate under high pressure. Veins are low pressure, so the blood doesn't come spilling out like crazy. And as soon as the blood, even the vein blood, systemic veins are blue, deoxygenated or less oxygenated. But as soon as it hits the air, it turns red. It glows red, that's why. So we take the blood and now, I don't know if the, the lab should tell you that these tubes are what's called heparinized. So you have to stop the coagulation or the blood will be a mess because you don't want the blood to coagulate. So usually the tube has a lining of anticoagulant in it, heparinized tube, they call it. So they put the blood in the tube from the syringe and then they spin it down. And you'll see that in the lab today, how they spin it down, how long. And then you see this at the end, and this is called it's not a good mixture. It's called a suspension. Right? A suspension. Meaning that it kind of settles out if in time. And the red blood cells and the hemoglobin and the iron all kind of go to the bottom. And that's what you see on the bottom is the red blood cells. Then you see the straw-colored plasma and this little buffy coat in between, which has your platelets and your white blood cells. Remember I said five? Yeah, I think five now. So we're gonna go through each one of them as, as quick as I can just to get you going. So the heaviest, the most dense settles at the bottom and that's your erythrocytes. But don't forget there's also iron, there's also hemoglobin. So they're gonna call that hematocrit, you'll see in the lab. But you still can get the red blood cell count which is 4.2 to 6.2 million per deciliter of blood or cubic millimeter, whatever your lab says. So this little tiny 1% or less than 1% is your platelets and your white blood cells. And most of the, the, most of the blood is plasma. 92% of your plasma is water. So that's pretty high. That's pretty high. And this, this chapter will go through what's in there, but you're gonna learn. So hematocrit, that's what you're gonna do in the lab and percent volume of all your formed elements, right? Percent of erythrocytes only though, mostly, because that includes hemoglobin too. So hematocrit, here's the normal numbers, the male's a little bit higher than females in percent of what's in the blood. So now you can do, this is, this is the cool part. It's too bad you can't do this in lab. You can't do it at home unless you have a microscope. Um, you do a blood smear. Now, this is not pulling blood from a vein. This is just poking the, the finger with a, a little pin prick, a little lancet, which kind of gets the blood to come out nice and easy, and you squeeze it onto the microscope slide. So you can see the anuclear biconcave discs, pinkish, staining red blood cells. Then you, then you can see like the really large white blood cells. Right? They're larger and they have a nucleus because the nucleus generally stains darker. 
And platelets are like little pieces of cells, which you'll see. Very cool blood smear. So, oh, here's a nice blood smear. See, like you see the lancet, you see the um, microscope and you put a cover slip on and you learn how to do that. And this is your blood. So all the white is plasma, plasma. It's really hard to see platelets sometimes. You don't know if that's an artifact on the, thing, on the slide or something, but those are platelets in there. They're little fragmented pieces. So anything that obviously is small and kind of unequivocal, no nucleus, then that's the platelet. But look at this, you can see the red blood cells. There's a nice, this is kind of like a, a whitish area in the middle because there's not a nucleus and it's a biconcave disc. Like biconvex is like a football. Biconcave is if you hollow the football out, you know? So it's the opposite of uh, convex, it's concave. The erythrocyte red blood cell, which now you know what that means. And you probably did before. So just look at the white blood cells and we'll go through each one of them because these are the, this is the hard part. You have to be able to look at the white blood cell nuclei and you know see which of the five it is. So let's look at the most, this is the most common white blood cell. It's called a neutrophil. You might've heard of a macrophage, a phagocyte. Macrophage is a big eater. Phage means to eat. Neutrophil is like a little eater. Neutrophil is more involved in bacterial infection. So if you have a bacterial infection, like a UTI, and you do the histology with the kidney, God forbid, or the urethra, you could see many neutrophils because they're, be, they're responding to a bacterial infection. Sometimes they call them PMNs, polymorphonuclear cell, polymorphonuclear cell, because the nucleus is very polymorphic. Look at it. Nothing really looks like the eosinophil kind of looks like that a little bit. So you got to be careful with the eosinophil. And neutrophil generally stains bluish. Right? Then you have, let's see, uh, the monocytes usually have a horse. This is a classic monocyte. So the, the nucleus is big, but it, it's kind of a horseshoe. Whereas the lymphocyte, the nucleus takes up most of the cytoplasm. So this one's kind of tough to tell, but. Okay, that's not big enough to be a lymphocyte. Let's call it a monocyte. So a monocyte is a blood cell, obviously, but in the tissue, a monocyte becomes a macrophage, which is a tissue phagocyte. So neutrophils are phages, but they're not macrophages. Monocytes become macrophages. Lymphocytes, you're going to see T and B, lymphocytes. T for thymus gland, B for bursa, where they found it in a bird. So... T cells are more involved, and B cells are more involved with viral infections. And you'll meet the eosinophil and the basophil because they look a little bit different. So you have to look at all the cells. That's what the lab's all about and decide what they are and generally know what they do, right? So plasma, here's your components. Again, this is repetitive, this particular PowerPoint. Plasma protein is very important for osmotic pressure and all your dissolved molecules and ions, including hormones. Don't forget about extracellular fluid. I mean, this is extracellular fluid in the blood vessel, but there's ECF outside, right? So they, they, they call it two different things, like interstitial fluid is between cells, but I don't like this here because I just like to call it plasma, right? We know the difference, we, like I showed you the compartments before the cytosol the ECF, which is interstitial fluid, and then the plasma. Blood is a colloid, right? It's a colloid, but settles out as a suspension. Colloid means there's usually proteins involved, like milk is a, is a, is a colloid, right? It kind of shows white, whitish, because the proteins that are in it. So it is a colloid when it comes to protein, especially the plasma, but when it's settled out in the test tube, it's a suspension. That's the difference. In your, in your blood vessels, it's a colloid, but in the test tube, it's a suspension, if you miss that. Albumin, I mentioned that. Globulins are carriers, and sometimes your antibodies, right, which partly protein. Fibrinogen is for clotting. When you hear fibrin, 
Fibrinogen is a soluble protein, but fibrin is not. So that's about clotting. So that's clotting proteins, enzymes, of course, and hormones. So mostly produced in the liver is basically the, these enzymes. Fibrinogen is produced in the liver. Avium is produced in the liver. Okay, so right now you really don't have to know that for lab, although I'm just going into as much as I can to prepare you for today's lab. So this goes into the proteins, right? Osmotic pressure. When you think osmotic pressure, think albumin, right? And that's the most abundant protein in the plasma. Good. And then you have your globulins, your alpha globulins, and your beta globulins, and your Gamma globulins. Gamma globulins, you should know something about right now because we're all on lists to get these uh, vaccines and build up gamma globulins in our blood, right? We're not giving the gamma globulins with the vaccine. Be clear on that. Somebody who has an immunosuppressed situation where they, they can't make their own gamma globulins, then we'd have to give them gamma, gamma globulins. But we want to build these up with a vaccine. The vaccine is actually the, the virus being injected into your body. Okay, so back fibrinogen about clotting. We hear fibrin think clotting, regulatory proteins, um, mostly hormones, regulation. Blood is considered a solution as well, all right, because it's things that can be dissolved, like your electrolytes, potassium, calcium, sodium, and chloride, or your electrolytes, all the ions. So the ions I mentioned are basically your electrolytes and they help out with osmotic pressure and of course with muscle contraction and all that so gas waste we have to get out usually veins systemic veins take out the waste bring it to the kidney liver and large intestine now this polar nonpolar i'm not going to go into that here but you know you should know that polar is like proteins and carbohydrates that are water soluble. Nonpolar, like I said before, like a lipid or a steroid, a cholesterol is a steroid, they require protein carriers. That's why I mentioned those proteins in the blood. Let's look at some pictures here. Very wordy, this thing. So again, this is more than you need. Hematopoiesis, now this is of course important. Hematopoiesis is building blood cells. And this happens in the red bone marrow. Remember that from AMP1, make a big deal out of hematopoiesis, right? And you have the stem cells, which are hematoblasts. And the, this is myeloid is part of the bone marrow that forms these particular site, um, cells. Now that's the lineage to where they come from. You have a lymphoid line and a myeloid line. So that might come up in your lab, like the stem cells for red blood cells and most um, white blood cells, except for lymphocytes, come from myeloid cells. I like this word, megakaryocyte. That's the precursor cell for the platelets. So when they're young, like erythrocytes and thrombocytes, when they're young, stem cells, they actually have nuclei, but it's, it's ejected. And I'm not sure if you have to know the whole lineage of a red blood cell, but you'll see how that happens. Whew. Okay, and colony stimulating factors that stimulate hematopoiesis. Now, hematopoiesis is important because when we're low in oxygen, we have to make more red blood cells. When our immune system is activated, we have to make more white blood cells, and it all happens in the red bone marrow. Crazy. Remember, red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they, they, don't, they don't undergo mitosis. So they get to live for like four months or 120 days, and then they got to be recycled for their parts and built again in the red bone marrow. And the liver and spleen have a lot to do with the garage sale of red blood cells. White blood, they, they, white blood cells, they can um, undergo mitosis. So erythropoiesis, you should know this, is only red blood cells. Like hemopoiesis was all, all blood cells. But erythro means red. So now we're making red blood cells. And, the, and they start in the myeloid stem cells in the um, red bone marrow, right? Then there's a progenitor cell. Progenitor is a, when you hear genesis in the beginning, it's a beginning cell, but it knows it's going to be a red blood cell now. Pro beginning, erythroblast. Blast is a very immature cell. 
then another erythroblast. And this still has a nucleus, crazy. Normal blast is in between. So reticular site, reticular site is right before it's mature. So if you're low in oxygen, let's say you climb Mount Everest, right? And which is a very low partial pressure of oxygen in the air. You're gonna make a ton of these reticulocytes, but your blood's gonna get too thick and useless really. It takes time, right? Like the Sherpas who are hanging out on the mountain, they have a very good um, oxygen carrying capacity at low oxygen partial pressures because they, they've been, they're used to this. We, we would get violently ill if we had too many reticulocytes because we're low in oxygen. And we'd have polycythemia, which is excess red blood cells. Like you've heard of anemia. Anemia is decreased red blood cells. So decreased oxygen carrying capacity, but excess reticulocytes is polycythemia. And then they become erythrocytes, right? Then they lose all their organelles. Like red blood cells don't need a mitochondria or ribosome because they're, they're just, they're built and they die. So all they need is hemoglobin really. They have a plasma membrane, no nucleus. So all they need is hemoglobin in there. So white blood cells being produced, I don't think we have to go into this too much, but it has the same blast, blast, right? And then site, starting from a stem cell or progenitor cell. It should be a nice little um, table to show you how this works. In the labs, it'll, it'll show you how far back you need to go. So lymphoid stem cells give you the B and T lymphocytes. These are your B cells and T cells. So they mature into your... T cells and B cells. Remember, T means thymus. That's a gland right above your heart. That it's kind of like a boarding school for T cells where they mature, and that's where we found these T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes they found actually in a chicken, in a bird, and in the bursa of the chicken. So that's why they say B. Okay, so some differentiate. Some lymphoid cells become these are cool. NKC, which is natural killer cells, are also lymph lymphoid stem, from lymphoid stem cells. Now these are, these are big game hunters. They'll, they'll just see a cancer cell or a nasty virus and attack it. Of course, that's part of your immune system. This is talking about the platelets. So this is cool. The megacarrier blast is myeloid, but always remember megacarrier blast is the precursor to a platelet. Okay, so pre-platelets, pro-platelets. I don't know how deep you really need to go into that. I mean, I'm doing a lot. I just want to give you a good idea. So I believe this is the lineage that shows you where they, what lines they come from. So it's pretty clear. You know, here's the lineage of your red blood cell. Here's the bone marrow, spongy bone, right? Is where the marrow is. So these are the myeloid, and here's the lymphoid. Is only lymphocytes and NKCs. So you follow those down and you can see where the nucleus is ejected, right? And then it becomes a mature erythrocyte. Megacarrier blast, where's the megacarrier site, I'm sorry. Megacarrier site ejects a nucleus and then it becomes a platelet. So you need to know the mature. So now we have to start looking at the white blood cells because that's you know, still myeloid. So they, these are called granulocytes because they have granules in them too. Like lymphocytes don't have granules. Monocytes look more like lymphocytes. So they're a little bit different, but they're also from myeloid. So monocytes are a little bit different than the other three. These are granulocytes because they have granules in them, right? Erith uh, eosinophil, it stains red, but be careful, you still should know what it looks like. And look at the nucleus compared to the neutrophil. And then you have your basophil, which we didn't meet yet. And that has kind of a, a similar nucleus as the monocyte, but look at the mature ones. So you have to know what these look like over and over in the lab today, in your virtual labs. And here's your lymphocytes, which the, the T and B are hard to differentiate just looking at them under a microscope. So basically the function was more important. These are just, again, this I don't think is important because this is the embryology really of the cell, not of you, of the actual cells before they become um, mature. So this, this is gonna go on to talk about the red blood cells, which I gave you, I think, all the things you really need to know about um, the red blood cells. 
you know, you're going to learn that again in a little bit more while you're doing cardiovascular and lecture. Like all this, like this goes really deep into the red blood cell. So it talks about the hemoglobin and there's two chains of globins. And the heme is where the oxygen binds, just to make sure you know that. I mean, again, you got to get to this lab. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about it now. This is the molecular structure of hemoglobin. And here's what it looks like. Two separate chains of amino acids. So it's protein and a heme. Four binding sites for oxygen on one hemoglobin molecule. Erythropoietin is important. This is important in erythropoiesis, EPO. Like you've heard of blood doping, like athletes blood dope. They take EPO to try to increase their oxygen carrying capacity. But this is normally stimulated by the, the kidney. Right? EPO is secreted by the kidney in response to low oxygen. But of course, Lance Armstrong and buddies, they want to go to France at high altitudes and, and train and they, they blood dope and they take EPO. This is kind of cool, just showing you um, the process of, of hematopoiesis or erythropoiesis coming from the targeting the bone, bone marrow. So the EPO targets the bone marrow to make more red blood cells because it's erythro. Okay, and this is what we're talking about before. If you blood doping and your blood gets too thick, that's going to put a strain on your heart. And remember climbing Mount Everest, that's what happens to you, unless you're a Sherpa and you've been living there forever. Okay, this is about iron. Iron is Fe, right? So ferritin Fe is the carrying, the carrying form of iron. Fe is iron. That's why it's Fe because it's ferritin. Transferrin delivers the iron on a protein. 20, 120 days for a red blood cell. That's why they do the A1C for diabetes. They want to see how long glucose has been floating around that blood because it's 120 days. So if it's been there for 120 days, that's a long time to be having glucose in your blood. And then you have to watch that commercial like you saw during the Super Bowl for trulicity, which decreases the A1C and the amount of glucose that's in your blood if you're type two diabetic or on the borderline. Anemia is low blood cells, especially red blood cells. Polycythemia is too many. Right? And you can look at the, the, the blood cells like sickle cell anemia is a horrible disease where the proteins in hemoglobin have a mutation and the shape of the cell is like a sickle and it can't carry oxygen correctly and it can't even fit through a capillary. That's really bad. So I don't think we have, we have to go through the anemias for your lab, but just know what anemia means. So let's stop for a minute, see how you're doing. Everybody okay? Going on and on here. I'm going on. Yeah. You didn't stop me, Tom. Yes. <laughs> we didn't stop. That was a lot. But that's a little more. So we'll, blood typing is kind of complicated. So you got to stay with me. It's a simple process when you think about it, but it's um, we might as well learn it. And then before you go into the lab, so you have an easy time. So this is, you know, it's the ABO method. So bear with me on that. It's... Um, because the problem with the blood type is how the question's asked. Like if a person is type AB and they receive blood from a type O person in transfusion, what's going to happen to that blood? And that's really what the question is. Like, it's all about transfusions because I don't even know why we have blood types, except I really don't know why we have blood, uh, blood types, right? Like A, A, B, B, and O. Those are the blood types. Then you have the add this. RH factor, which makes it positive or negative. So I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure, but it comes in real handy if you need to get blood from somebody. If I have to get blood from Samantha, it's got to match. If I'm AB positive and she's AB positive, cool, right? Right, if Casey's type O, cool, that's good. I can get Casey's blood because O is the universal donor. So that's what it's all about. It's about getting transfusion when it comes to it. It's all laboratory stuff. So anybody have any questions about the blood and what you go into? So you have to know what the blood cells look like, what the basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets, what they all look like under a microscope before you come to lab uh, whenever next week, which we're not going to meet. But by the time those 
uh, and you only have one week to do the lab. So, so that's Sunday. You should know what all the red, all the blood cells look like. Pretty good, right? Pretty good. That gives you a lot of time. So go get it when the lab starts later. Okay, so blood typing. That's basically what we're doing. ABO blood typing group is what we're calling it. We'll talk about the positive and negative RH later. But I got to go over a couple of terms with you. First of all, on the red blood cell, now we're talking about red blood cells here. On the membrane of the red blood, blood cells, sometimes we have these, sometimes we don't, but most of the time we do. We have what's called an antigen. Or multiple antigens, and we do have multiple antigens. Why, I don't know. But let me tell you what an antigen is. It's usually a protein or a glycoprotein that is called anti means antibody generator. So it's gonna create a reaction in your own body if, if, if it's coming from the outside, of course. So an antigen is anything that the body could pick up as foreign. Now, and, and like, like a, a COVID-19 or, or streptococcus or something, a tissue transplant antigen, like if you're getting somebody's kidney, your body's gonna see that as an antigen. So your antigens that are on your, your own red blood cells, you don't have antibodies against them. Could you understand that? I just said something that's really important. Did you hear what I just said? Because that's really important. Like we have antigens on our own blood cells. Like if I'm type AB, I have both antigens on my blood cells, which I cannot have the antibodies or else I'd be losing blood cells, right? So it makes no sense, but that's where we live, right? We have, if I'm type AB, I have both antigens on every one of my red blood cells, but I don't have the antibodies that would destroy them. So please live there. I know that's hard. So if you're type A, right, type A, that means you have the antigen on your blood cell and you have no anti-A antibodies, obviously, or else you'd be agglutinating your own blood. No A antibodies. But you do have, guess what you do have? You do have B antibodies. Not anti antigen, but you have the B antibodies. So a type of blood type B that has B antigen has the anti-A antibody. So type B cannot give you blood. So there's a term called agglutination. Look at two Gs. Agglutination happens when somebody with type B blood in any antibody containing blood, type B blood is given to type A. The anti-B antibodies in the type A person is gonna destroy the type B blood because it has the B antigen. And agglutination is a clumping where the antibodies bind to the antigen and that makes a mess and you destroy that blood. So type A blood, means you have the A antigen. Type B blood means you have the B antigen on your red blood cells. Type AB means you have both A and B antigens and no antibodies. So antibodies destroy antigens. They're, they're, they're lymphocytes, right? Type O, doesn't have an antigen, no, no A or B antigen. So what you have to get is three A words here. You have to know what an antigen is. You have to know what an antibody is. And you have to know what agglutination means. So this is why type O is the universal donor because you can't destroy, you can give it to type A, you can give it to type B, you can give it to type AB because there's no antigens on it to agglutinate with. 
But type O has both antibodies, but that's that's not an issue. It, you won't destroy anybody's blood with a, the little bit of blood that you're getting. So that's kind of complicated. So go through that uh, thing close. So this explains a little more. That's why I put this PowerPoint up. You know, person's antigen status, type A, right? They, of course, don't have anti A antibodies. So the anti A antibodies react with the surface antigen A. Anti B antibodies will destroy and agglutinate surface antigen B. So, type A blood, this is where it gets confusing. Type A blood has anti B antibodies. Type B blood has anti A, so you can't mix those two. So you kind of have to memorize that. You know, type B blood has the B antigen and it has anti A antibodies. Type E has neither antibodies, but it has both antigens. Type O has no antigens, no AB antigens, but it has the A and B antibodies. And that's not such a problem. So you, O again is the universal donor and AB technically would be the universal recipient because it doesn't have A or B antibodies. So type AB is the universal recipient, type O is the universal donor. And once you go through all this, you'll you'll get it. It might take the three times though. So, you know, it's not that easy sometimes. So this is a nice picture, McGraw Hill does for you here. It shows you the actual spikes on the, the, the glycoproteins that are on the surface of these red blood cells. And it shows what type A has, like these are the A antigens and it's carrying in the plasma, you have anti-B antibodies, so forth with type B and type AB has no antibodies and type O has no antigens. So this is where you should live. Uh, maybe even look at this while you're doing the lab. Now the RH factor is just another antigen. Um, and we found this in rhesus monkeys, which is another, and, and there are other antigens on your blood cells that we don't have any idea what they do. Uh, this is also known as antigen D, in case you're wondering, there's, there's like other, there's like A, e, B, C, D, and E, but the one that on our red blood cell is the D, and that was, corresponds to the RH factor. So if you're RH, positive and that goes along with the AB so you'd have to add like if you're type AB so AB plus has all three antig antigens it has type it has A antigen B antigen and the D antigen or also known as the RH antigen so here it is here's the RH positive here so it's like 85 percent I think of the population is positive so of course you're not gonna have antibodies. You're not gonna have antibodies against your own RH. So you have the D antigen and there's no antibodies against the RH or D, same thing. RH negative, you don't have the antigen. And here's where it gets sticky, literally sticky. So now, even though you don't have the D antigen, you're not making anti-RH antibodies until you're exposed to it. So that develops, that does, you're not born with it. Like the, the antibodies that you have for AB, you know, um, AB doesn't have antibodies though. So, so, so technically it's AB, you know, not AB. So those you're kind of born with and genetically wired to have them, but the RH antibodies or the D antibodies are acquired. Let me repeat that. The A anti antibody, the B antibody, and I'm saying antibody, not antigen. The A antibody, the B antibody, and the O, which is both antibodies, has both antibodies. They're wired in your on your blood cells, but the antibody, or not on your blood cells, in your blood, sorry. But the D antibody, RH, only comes after exposure, so that's acquired. So the, uh, your book is probably gonna explain it about being pregnant, and I'll talk about that. So agglutination is the clumping when the ant during the antibody antigen reaction, and that happens in transfusion. So again, the lab will take you through this and give you some really good practice. So please do this one three times before 
the end of the week so you have, you have a nice idea. And of course, if they're agglutinating, you're going to get lysis of the blood cells and they're going to rupture and they're going to be useless. Okay, they're going to die and split. So again, this is going on about the agglutination test and this is what you're doing in lab. You'll add the antibodies to a blood sample and see if they agglutinate, like this is agglutination here. This is no agglutination. So if you treat, um, what, what blood type is this? this is type A. So if you treat type A with antibody B, you're not gonna see anything because it already has that antibody. But if you put the antibody, antibody A on it, it's gonna clump. So this is what agglutination looks like. Okay, and that's what you're gonna do um, in your lab this week. Now the RH, here's the deal with the RH. Let me explain this to you before you go in. I, um, I think you're gonna do this, uh, I'm pretty sure. I, I think I remember seeing it, it's, but they, I don't know how well they explain it because you're doing it. So here's the deal, right? So pay attention to this, I think I'm recording, right? I'm recording, please say I'm recording, yes. So here's what happens. Let's say you have a RH positive father with a RH negative mother. Yes, I got it right. Okay, so again, it, it, RH is 85%. It's not like blood types, which is straight up sex link. Um, not sex link, but um, one out of four chances you're gonna, you're gonna have one of the parents' blood types. So RH is a little more rare not to have it. So if the mom is RH negative, the dad is RH positive. So there's a good chance that the baby, the pre if the mom gets pregnant, the baby, a newborn or the fetus, could be RH positive because the dad is RH positive. Everybody agree? You don't have to do a Punnett square to figure that out or read a genetics for dummies, which I have to do every week because it's such a hard topic. So now she gets pregnant, mom's pregnant, and the baby, the and this is her first pregnancy, very important. This is her first pregnancy. So the baby or the fetus is RH positive. Now I'll see if you're paying attention because I know you get lost on this. Will the mother's blood, her RH negative blood destroy the fetus's blood? No. 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 For the first Why, JLo or Vincent or Betsaida? Because the I think it with the first baby it um, registers the antibodies for yeah you know, she doesn't have an acquired immunity against it yet she didn't she wasn't exposed to it yet but now and, and she's technically she's not being exposed to it while she's pregnant so nothing's going to happen to the first fetus because she doesn't have the antibodies against the D ant antigen or RH antigen. But here's what happens. You know, I've been there. It's a messy process delivering a baby, right? I mean, things are ripping, placenta's bleeding. So, so the mother's blood, her frank blood, the blood's coming from her systemic uh, vessels, that blood could mix with the baby's blood. And now she, her blood is directly exposed to the RH antigen. So her B cells and T cells, they, they develop a memory, which is what a vaccine does, basically. It's an immunity against that antigen. Because remember, antigen is a foreign protein, glycoprotein, and it, it's an antigen. It, it's an antibody generator. So her immune system, as smart as it is, is going to start building up antibodies against the D antigen, against the RH antigen. So now she's still married to the same dude or whatever, or their partners or whatever. And then she gets pregnant again from the same RH positive father. And again, the fetus is RH positive. Now we got a problem. Now she's delivering those antibodies through the placenta into the blood and causing hemolytic disease of the newborn, erythroblastosis vitalis. And it, her blood will destroy her antibodies will destroy that fetus's blood and they will survive, okay? I know that's kind of a sketchy way to do it, but you know, that's something you should, it helps you understand what an antigen is and then you understand what the antibodies is and how you're gonna acquire antibodies. So how do we prevent 
um, hemolytic disease of the newborn in that scenario, if it happens again, or to some other couple, uh, it's always the second pregnancy you worry about. How do we prevent that? Well, first of all, you have to know the genetic um, setup for the RH antigen on both parents. And then you can find out the baby's or the fetus's RH factor, if it's there or not. So you could administer what's called the Rogam. And that is an anti-antibody. It stops the antibody production in the mother so you won't um, destroy. I think they do it all the time now. I mean, like even, they don't even have to do the test. They just give it to you. If you're RH negative, anyway. So they, they don't even have to check the baby's um, genetics. So, so the thing with the RH antigen, which is also known as D antigen, is not the first pregnancy, it's the second pregnancy. And of course you want to have ideal, will it, like, could you give, like, here's what you're going to do in the lab. Can you give AB negative blood to somebody who's, or AB positive blood to somebody who's AB negative? Yeah, you can. You can, you know, it, it's all about the transfusion. That, that's what the questions are built around. Like, is it, are you going to destroy that blood that's given to you? That's the bottom line. Like an A, an A person, an A, and this is going to work. It's a little tricky, and hopefully you'll figure this out when you do it in the lab. A type A blood person can give um, an AB person blood. An AB person can give A blood because it depends on how you know the emergency. Is it ideal? No. Ideally, you want to be giving a type A person type A or type O. And an AB, ideally, you want to give them AB. And you can take it a step further by if, if you're AB positive, you want to get AB positive blood or O blood or O positive blood or O negative blood if you are if you are AB negative. So I know it's confusing. There's a lot of scenarios. Um, and the only way to learn this is by um, doing doing the examples. So again, we don't have a lab next week, but we have like, I'm gonna do a review and I wanna get you prepared for a test. So I'll probably give you some examples to do. And I'll, and I'll give you the answers before the, um, the exam. When is the exam again? 22nd? So, so figure by the 20th, when we do the review, you'll be all set. Like you'll, you'll have everything you need and you'll feel comfortable. So, so it's pretty good. You kind of got like a week off and a lot of time. So you can concentrate on your lecture, which is much more intense, I'm sure between endocrine and cardio. So anybody have any questions? And everybody out there, please let me know if you don't have McGraw-Hill Connect because you have to get these, these labs done. Let me just take attendance again. I'm trying, I'm just, I gotta get this to your lecture instructor to make sure that you get your credit for your financial aid if you're using it or for your grade. Tariq, are you here? Is there a Tariq here? Kataka, uh, Ariana, are you here? I thought I saw you. Mary Kate, are you here today? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry to keep asking, but I really want to get this to you. University, uh, Nicole Pryor. Hi, I'm here. Excellent, excellent. Vincent, Vincent Turnover. He here. I thought I saw your name. How are you? Well. Nice job on the virtual labs, buddy. Thank you. Cheyenne, are you here? Cheyenne, not here. So everybody okay? Anybody have any questions? I, th I think we covered it. The um, that pre-lab I put in there is kind of useless. You can go, you can look at it. Uh, that's from the lab manual that's built into McGraw-Hill. I think you're going to have to go through my not mine, but McGraw-Hill textbook PowerPoint that I just went through. Professor? Jennifer? Uh, 